I'm going to speak a little bit about the ways in which automation is impacting both workers and firms, um, and about some of the models that already exist that could help uh, both uh, firms and workers to adapt. And this is drawn from two recent research reports that we've put out, uh, both for the, uh, the Government of Ontario, one looking at uh, automation trends on a sectoral level um, and their implications for particular communities, and the other looking at international case studies for um, upskilling and retraining models. So very quickly, to begin with, I just want to acknowledge that automation is not the only uh, tech trend that's impacting work. Um, there is a growing demand for digital skills across the economy, uh, and technology is also allowing for jobs to be unbundled into tasks, which is increasing precarity for some and flexibility for others, and allowing jobs to be, or job tasks, I should say, to be performed anywhere in the world. Um, so these trends really are interacting, um, and their combined effect, I think, is something we should be paying attention to. But I'll turn now to um, some of the work we've done on automation in particular. I won't belabor the point that automation is impacting the future of work, because I think we all know that, and we've probably heard enough about it. But I did want to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about how that's happening and who is it being affected by it. Um, because I think there's some really important design implications associated with some of these dynamics. Uh, solutions should be uh, built with particular people, um, industries, regions, and skills in mind. So just quickly, um, some of the, the reports around automation have tended to exaggerate, I think, the, the risk, um, because it's easier to think about the potential for current jobs and tasks to be automated than it is to think about entirely new jobs and industries and tasks that may be created as economies change going forward. Um, that said, I, I think it's important to note that uh, there's a significant amount of work in our labor market that could be affected by automation. And I, I think one of the jobs of policy is to think about different potential future scenarios that are possible and plan for all of them. So I put this slide up just to, um, to emphasize that, that this has the potential to be a significant uh, set of changes. About 36% of jobs in Canada's labor market as of 2016 contain half or more um, of their tasks that could be automated uh, according to McKinsey's task-based analysis. Uh, which is almost 7 million jobs. So it's not a small number. Um, that certainly doesn't mean that all of these jobs or all of these tasks are going to be automated, um, but I think it does serve to show the magnitude of this, this one potential future. We also know that these impacts are going to affect people in different ways. Um, there's a report that we put out a little while ago now in 2016, the talented Mr. Robot, that did a breakdown by uh, income and education and showed that jobs that were more susceptible to automation uh, tended to be filled by people with lower average incomes and lower levels of education. We also know that it will impact industries differently, uh, industries such as food services, uh, manufacturing, uh, and others that we're familiar with uh, have a higher concentration of tasks that could technically be automated. Uh, and it will vary by geography. Uh, for instance, cities and towns that have a higher concentration of work in particular industries and that have a less diverse local economy uh, could be more exposed to some of these impacts. Um, the other element of this that I think it's important to kind of keep remembering is that uh, one of the other dimensions to this is the creation of new jobs and new tasks and new skill demand in the economy. Um, historically, technological change has created more jobs than it's destroyed, and one of the examples of this that, um, that I think is particularly compelling is that of agriculture in Canada. Uh, employment in agriculture um, has, has dramatically declined. Uh, throughout our history, and at the same time, overall employment increased, um, and demand for jobs in the, the production of the machines and the robotics that have been incorporated into agriculture um, has also increased. Oops. Ah. Sorry, this is also giving me some trouble. Okay. So, um, so demand for certain skills is likely to decline as technology disrupts certain industries, while demand for other skills that complement technology is likely to increase. So some of the, the ways in which, or some of the trends um, that we're seeing in, in terms of areas where demand is likely to grow are around things like um, uh, human judgment. So as AI technologies make it easier to predict um, and therefore um, inform decision making, uh, we still will need people to make the decisions based on that, that information. Um, there's also <laughs> growing demand, as we've already heard, for digital skills. Um, there was a study, I think, last year uh, looking at the U.S. labor market that showed a jump um, from 45 to 70 percent uh, in terms of jobs that required a medium or high level of digital skill. 
Um, and there's growing demand for social skills as well. I think we, we need to, and we've been hearing a bit about it, we need to unpack what that really means. I think there have been a lot of reports lately that have talked about growing demand for tech and soft skills, which can mean a lot of different things. Um, but this at least, I think, serves to underline that, um, that this isn't just about the, the skills that are likely to see declining demand, but also about those that will see growth. So change is happening, um, but in fact, some of the work that we've done for the Ontario government suggests that it may not be happening fast enough. Um, so I want to walk through some of the findings from this research that we did on automation trends by sector um, to, to kind of make the point that uh, in some cases, firm and worker success are more closely intertwined than we might think. And if firms aren't automating fast enough to remain competitive in global markets, um, that's very tied to the fate of workers as well. Um, so this report uh, that came out, I think about two months ago now, uh, was looking at a more granular um, layer of understanding automation impacts by sector and community. So we looked at the manufacturing and the finance sectors in particular, um, and we, we interviewed um, employers of companies of different sizes, um, union representatives, uh, colleges and training organizations, um, and we also went into a bunch of different communities across the province to understand how people were perceiving these changes. One of the things that we, we did in the course of this work was develop a frame for understanding how automation and, uh, and labor markets interact. So I think a lot, of, um, a lot of the work that we've done and that others have done, um, I think, tends to focus on the theoretical level, um, the potential for certain tasks or jobs to be automated. Um, but in fact, employers are going to consider a lot more than the technical co possibility of automating a task when they make a decision to adopt a certain kind of technology. Um, so we used this diagram um, as a frame for uh, the conversations that we were having with, um, with our interviewees. Um, and it, it, I think, serves to illustrate that there are a number of internal and external factors for a firm that will drive decisions to automate. They'll look at the cost of uh, labor relative to the cost of technology. Uh, global competitive pressures will drive those choices. The availability of skills within the company um, to allow them to identify opportunities to adopt uh, automation technologies, to roll them out effectively and to work alongside them effectively was a big one that kept coming up. And that, I think, is quite interesting because it links these conversations more squarely, uh, the conversations about um, firm competitiveness and, uh, and worker skills training. We also looked at the different impacts that uh, automation can have when it is adopted, which also vary by firm, by industry, by community, by person. Um, for workers, this can mean job, uh, in rare cases, job elimination, uh, in some cases, task elimination. It can also change the quality of jobs in positive and negative ways. That was actually one of the major themes that, that came out, um, and it can change skill demand. We, we um, found that there were a lot of differences. Uh, there were some similarities, but quite a few differences in terms of how uh, employers were talking about the barriers to automation and the opportunities for automation uh, within their sectors. In manufacturing, for instance, an aging workforce is one of the dynamics at play that's um, causing firms to think more about automating. It might increase the intensity of automation in the near future uh, because their population of skilled employees is aging out of the workforce and they don't necessarily have a strategy to backfill for them. So they're thinking about technology as one of the ways to do that. Um, they're also facing increasing global pressure, uh, not only from low labor cost jurisdictions as in the past, but increasingly from advanced manufacturing jurisdictions. And in fact, China is increasingly competing on both of those fronts. On the other hand, um, there, is a lot of, um, there are a lot of barriers that are slowing down the adoption of new technologies within the manufacturing sector in the province. Um, one of those is that, particularly for small firms, there's a lot of hesitancy about making a, a large uh, investment in a new technology um, without understanding if it's going to become obsolete because the pace of change is so fast. Um, and so there's actually, I think, a skill conversation to be had around the knowledge and awareness of, of C-suite executives uh, within some of these companies who are trying to navigate these decisions. Um, so one of the key conclusions, and I'm focusing just on some of the, the high-level manufacturing uh, findings to avoid um, taking too long up here. Um, but one of the key findings was that firms aren't automating fast enough. We kept hearing this theme that they're concerned about their ability to sustain themselves, to, to compete, let alone to grow, um, given that they're lagging in terms of tech adoption relative to peer countries and, uh, and in terms of productivity as well. Um, one of the things we found interesting in looking at the data on the manufacturing sector is that um, 
employment has been dropping, as we know, over the last number of years for reasons that aren't just isolated to, uh, to technology adoption. It's also about offshoring and productivity more broadly. Um, but in fact, some jurisdictions that have adopted technology faster um, have shown lower uh, declines in, uh, in employment. So they've done better in terms of employment figures uh, and in terms of tech adoption figures. Um, so it's a more complex relationship than I think we sometimes think. When we spoke with Ontarians, we heard a wide range of perspectives. Uh, for example, uh, we, we heard from a farming family in the Owen Sound area that automating their milk barn had allowed them to spend fewer hours working. They could sleep in, they could leave the farm because the cows could be milked and monitored without them physically there. Um, from people in the Sudbury area, we heard that although automation had radically decreased the number of jobs, it had also radically improved safety, taking squishy things out of the mines. Um, and when we talked to people in the skilled trades in a number of different communities, we heard that automation was making their jobs more boring, that they were being reduced to button pushing and that their skills were being devalued. So a really wide range of perspectives, but across the board heard that people felt underprepared for these changes. Communities were really concerned that they, you know, they could handle one firm automating, but if five automated within the same time frame, they would really struggle. Uh, and so there was a desire for more information uh, and for more cross-sector collaboration. So the key conclusion from this particular research was that we're seeing a dual challenge. Uh, on the one hand, we need to see probably faster uh, investment in automation technologies in order for firms to remain competitive. And on the other, if the pace of automation intensifies, the impacts on workers will also heighten. Um, and obviously, the attention uh, is needed into, um, we need to be paying attention to how to help those workers adapt. And I, I think the, the relationship between those two challenges is a really interesting one to unpack because, in fact, the ability of firms to automate is somewhat dependent on the skills of their workforce. Um, and so there's, I think, uh, an interesting opportunity to look at models that uh, recognize um, that firm and worker success can be um, a kind of a joint goal. Um, so I'm going to take you through now two case studies. This was a, a subsequent piece of research we did looking at international case studies for reskilling and upskilling that I think helped to illustrate this point. So the first one is in North Carolina. Um, this is the BioWork program. This kind of came out of um, a pretty rocky period in the state's history uh, where traditional manufacturing was really taking a nosedive. But at the same time, uh, BioPharma was collecting around um, some of the universities in the state and they had some talent needs that actually somewhat aligned with where the layoffs were happening in traditional manufacturing. So traditional manufacturing was, was shedding jobs in production line work, um, and biopharma was looking for production line technicians. And so the state, along with some philanthropic actors, the colleges, and employers, got together and created a program called BioWork. Um, and this was aimed at satisfying industry needs on the one hand, but also at um, helping workers who were being displaced by changes in the economy, um, helping them uh, find a pathway into employment. It was particularly targeted at people that didn't have a university or college degree. And the program was designed, as we've, we've already heard, along, um, along the lines of like kind of modular, short, um, training uh, opportunities that people could take in kind of a piecemeal way that were very much aligned with employer needs. The credentials were designed with employers. They recognized them, they trusted them. Um, and so the program was, I think, an interesting example of, uh, of a multi-sector collaborative approach to um, one particular kind of lifelong learning. Uh, and the program was largely successful. Uh, so the graph on this slide shows the um, the steep decline in employment in traditional manufacturing industries in the state, uh, while you see the, um, the growth or kind of uh, ongoing demand uh, within, um, within the biopharma sector. Um, the, the participation in the program was quite high. Um, I think at its height, it was about 1,200. Last year, there were 500 people in the program. It's continuing. It's, it's been iterated as demands on the industry side have shifted. Um, and I think that's one of the important features of the program, that there's a kind of frequent uh, and open information sharing between all of the partners involved, um, so that they are able to pivot and be flexible as, um, as industry needs change. The other example that I'll speak about briefly is Nokia's bridge program in Finland. Uh, so Finland was faced with uh, the iPhone, and uh, their business model uh, went through some disruption. They ended up 
um, at their headquarters in Finland in particular, laying off almost 6,000 workers as a result of restructuring within the company. Um, and largely because I think they were concerned about their own image and concerned about their ability to maintain production while they were shedding workers, they made a large investment in a program for helping workers find pathways to worker training uh, or entrepreneurship. Um, and I think this is a, another interesting example of multi-sector collaboration in practice. They, they obviously had um, a vested interest in this kind of initiative uh, for the reasons I've just described, but they also knew that it was really important for local economies to, um, to not have this sudden flood of people that were laid off. And so they engaged local economic development organizations uh, and the national government uh, in co-investing in the program. Um, and they were able to leverage an existing uh, system of innovation policy supports uh, that was already quite, uh, okay. Thank you. Already quite well Thanks, established. <laughs> uh, so this program was also quite successful. Uh, this chart shows that the vast majority, over 80% of people, found pathways into reemployment uh, training uh, or entrepreneurship. And quickly, the, the entrepreneurship uh, part of this program was, I think, really interesting. A lot of the um, the locations where this happened saw this as, in fact, the, the most important benefit that they had had uh, very limited entrepreneurial cultures. Um, previous to this program, but there was an influx of, um, of new ventures that were created as a result of the support that Nokia provided to, um, to employees that wanted to take IP and spin out and create a new venture. Uh, I won't run through all of these, because I've already mentioned some of them, but I, I think some, uh, just a, a couple of these points to really underline in terms of what makes these types of models effective. Uh, resilient partner networks, I think, are really key. You need an anchor organization that can be the home for these types of models, but you need networks that are able to be agile and adjust as things change, and they need to be founded in collaborative design that engages all of those partners equally. So employers need to be informing what their skills demands are, and they need to trust the credentials and the process um, that's resulting in the development of, of new talent. Um, and colleges or training organizations that understand curriculum development need to be part of that mix as well. Um, I've mentioned transparent information sharing uh, and flexibility. Um, Up-to-date knowledge of demand and supply is obviously critical. Both of these programs use stakeholder engagement and surveys as tools to, um, to get information on how industry skill demand was, uh, was evolving. Um, and last point I'll make is that um, programs only work if they work for people. Um, so understanding who the people are, the workers, or the people that are looking to be trained are and what their needs are is, is a critical piece of this as well. So I'll end there. Um, sorry if I went over time, but oh, happy to take any questions on these or other models. <laughs>